Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. I mean, it's really great to see you. Great to see some some old friends who have helped me with this incredibly tortuous process and some lots of new names, too. So I just wanted to run through the plan for today. So what we're going to do, um, we're having a mixture of talk and Q&A and the Q&A will be through the chat and it will be moderated by Sam Brown and give a wave there. Um, and Sam, I I'm sure who many of you may know, is a responsible tech specialist from Consequential and has been a great partner helping me out and, and doing some really interesting work together. So what we will do, I will sort of do a quick introduction, about 10 minutes of, of the tech report and the trust in tech governance. We'll have a quick Q&A after that. And then I'll hand over to Tom Philbeck from the World Economic Forum. Hi, Tom. Um, and then following that, hand over to Michelle Patel from the Food Standards Agency. Thanks very much indeed. And then we'll have a Q&A after that. And I think we're, we're, we'll keep to an hour, but if there's lots of Q&A, we can happily stay on um, to, to you know, talk to people after that. And if not, we'll try and finish on the dot of, um, of two o'clock. Three o'clock, Hillary, three o'clock. So let me just then go straight into this about TikTok. TikTech is a research and consultation project. Um, it was kindly funded by the Fraunhofer Group, which I think many of you will know is Europe's largest applied sciences research group. And Ralph Linder is on there, who is part of the TikTech team at Fraunhofer ISSI, the Institute of Systems Innovation Research. And I think Tanya is on here too. Hello, Tanya. They are our academic partners. So TikTech really was a sort of um, civil society business and academic partnership. Um, and we're also supported kindly by the World Economic Forum. Thank you very much, Tom, for that, which they didn't give us any money as Fraunhofer was the funder. It means that I can just waft around saying World Economic Forum, which unless you think that Kraus Swab's an evil overlord about to take over the world is, is generally considered quite a good thing. Um, and the concept, this idea that Conrad von Kammerke um, my sort of co-founder had was this vision that the governance of technology, not the technologies themselves, but only, but the governance of the technologies in their own right should seek to earn societal trust. And we got together at this World Economic Forum Global Futures Council and batted this around with a few people um, and got our funding from Fraunhofer. Um, and off we went. And I think I'm just going to share the slides from here now. I think what was interesting um, play from start and share slides. Let me just do this. No multitasking here, working very well. Okay, and we'll get rid of that. So, can you see my slides, people here? Okay, Sam's nodding. So, let me just give you our approach. This was our starting point with this, which was, I think, ambitious is the euphemism I'm going to use. So we decided to take a helicopter view of trust from psychology, from behavioral science, from sociology, from responsible research and innovation. And this, you know, from my point of view, was a very, very confusing first eight months. Um, I remember sending this email to the team about eight months in saying, oh, my God, it's not me that's going mad. They don't agree. And they, it, there was su it's such a, a melee of different ideas about trust. The behavioral science folks often think it's about heuristics and biases. The psychology people have their own different views about what trust is and what isn't. And it took a little bit of sorting out to try and distill this into a sort of an understanding about trust and then applying that to technology governance and real world practice and then distilling that to practical ideas to help those in tech governance to earn trust. I spoke to another academic who said, you know, Hillary, that's a research question that we would recommend nobody took on anything that broad as that, <laughs> which I was beginning, I think Ralph and Tanya are the same, we're beginning to question that at some point ourselves. So let's have a look. Um, I'm going to start, in, I'm going to do two things today. I'm going to look about avoiding distrust and then I'm just going to run through four sort of light bulb moments. It's, it's, a, it's a really complex area and it's been really hard to distill. But for me, there were real pop out moments that about trust and about tech and about governance that really, really stick in my mind. I'd just like to share those with you now. So avoiding distrust. So, you know, we looked at that and I'm going to use here um, 
it's, it's top of mind for all of us, I think. This idea of the governance needing to earn trust as much as this, the technology itself. So here I'm losing the approval process for the COVID vaccines, because for us, the approval process of the COVID vaccines, it, the trust in that is as important as the trust in the science behind it. So distrust creeps in when governance seems to be letting making money or political capital take priority over people and planet. So you see with COVID, with extreme measures of Trump, but I think in the UK here, there's been some disquiet. Is this about political capital speeding ahead the process, approval process? Is it about making money? And, and there is concern there that these priorities are taking over the public interest priority. But also particularly distrust creeping in because it's very difficult to handle the ethics and values issues very effectively. And it's not an area in, in, in many ways that the governance of technology is, has been set up to handle in the past. It's much more complicated than health and safety risk or um, toxicology or some of those more traditional approaches that, that governance institutions and regulators are, are been set up to handle. And some of these ethical and values issues are pretty tricky. Um, and here, of course, for COVID, who's going to get it? You know, what about you know all of the balance of, of the different um, the different uh, vaccines themselves? But also, governance appears detached from what really happens. Now, perhaps less so more here, but I, I don't know if Roger Miles is on. But there's a lot of work being done showing how governance design is very detached from the way people work, the way the world works, the way companies work. But also that institutions themselves seem quite aloof, sometimes secretive, but, you know, but also quite difficult and understand and opaque. And I'll come to later that this perhaps could change if trust is an important component uh, for those organizations. So here's some light bulb moments. So when Conrad came to me with this idea that trust in the governance is important, I sort of said, yeah, 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 that's really quite interesting. But it wasn't until I really started to look into this, I thought actually trust in governance makes the world go round, not just trust. So if we think of all those trust decisions that we make every day, whether to buy something, to download something, to, to, you know, to vote for somebody. If you look at all those multiple choices that we make every single day, trust in the governance is part of a crazy number of those things. You know, we are trusting that Michelle and the Food Standards Agency have got their governance sorted and we can buy our food safe in the, in, in the knowledge that it is, it's not going to poison us. Um, but that was really quite a resonance, just how much trust we're giving in governance, not just general societal trust. But also some say too much trust. Now, I'm having some really interesting conversations at the moment, perhaps in the cyber area and the digital area. It's... It's, an, it's seen as sort of a mantra in a lot of areas. We need to increase public trust, increase public trust. But actually, what if there's too much trust? Perhaps the cyber area is saying, and, and some of the digital areas, we're trusting governance, we're trusting company governance too much. But then what of that sort of equation, when is you know, people saying that public should take more responsibility, they trust too much, when is that? lack of responsibility from those in governance and companies. And this is you know, a conversation that has been going round and round in, in the work that I've been doing at the moment. My second light bulb moment was, of course, Baroness Honora O'Neill's um, quite well known quote, certainly in the UK, which is first be trustworthy and then provide evidence that you are trustworthy. This is what trust is, you know, is all about. Now, I, I'm not going here into what is trustworthy governance at the moment. We've, we've, we've done a lot of work about that. We're still wrestling with that. But I just want to highlight today these concepts of good evidence that you're trustworthy. Because one of the projects we were looking at and, and, and analyzing all sorts of different citizens' dialogues and looking for where um, their relationship with governance and, and what they feel is you know, important for trust from their point of view. So citizens trust governance most when they can see that it's working, which is obviously natural, you would expect, standing up for the public interest, particularly laws created and enforced and breaches penalized. 
these very much are the traditional sort of belief in what governance is all about. Sometimes it actually isn't about that. Sometimes it's about shepherding um, innovation in different ways. Sometimes, particularly with these new digital, um, the new digital world, these sort of soft law or, or, or perhaps more self-regulatory approaches, they're not about you know, the iron fist of governance. And so again, I think there's an interesting area of work there about how those sorts of soft law approaches think about the impact of their governance in action. It's almost not, you know, we're on the ethical AI committee, well, that's okay, but what are you going to be doing about that? And I think citizens will be wanting to see more about that. I, I certainly hear it in my world. And I really like this quote from PA Consulting's really excellent report called Rethinking Regulation. Governance is changing. Regulators are seeing from not watchdogs of industry, which is a sort of finger wagging thing focused on constraints and, and, and enforcement, but actually champions of the public. And that opens up a different sort of role for governance in some ways, something that Michelle, I think, knows very well. Um, but this also opens up ideas of new competencies. So we, we're looking here at the engagement of stakeholders. Stakeholders are engaged in governance in three different ways, through communication, through how they are listened to and how they are co-create um, with governance designers. So the three competencies that we're looking at here, which is a new approach to communications. Regulators in particular really need to be out there more to be demonstrating that they are really have the public interest in mind in action. And we see this at the moment from the Competitions and Markets Authority in the UK trying to take on the tech companies. They're really doing an interesting and good job with that. Um, innovation in, in the involvement of citizens. Now, this is a really key part of that. Um, the, we, oh, no, I won't. I'm coming to that in a minute. Um, but also building trusted environments. And I know people from RIVM are on here. If we're having this more collaborative governance approach, where different stakeholders are working together to design governance, to design ethical and values-based um, regulatory approaches. This can't be done with people sitting in Whitehall, sitting in different regulatory environments on their own. It's increasingly about a more collaborative approach. Collaborative that obviously doesn't, in, in, in its own right, prevent um, sort of capture by vested interests, and by the loudest voices making, you know, steering governance design, but this idea of a trusted environment where it can be done um, fairly and collaboratively. Now, the third big um, light bulb moment for me actually was this one about trusting people makes them more likely to be trustworthy and trust you back. So trusting people first and the governance of Taiwan is, is, is taking this really on board. And regulators who trust people they're regulating are more likely to evoke trustworthy behavior and compliance. And that's, you know, governance is all about if you, you are bad and if you don't do it this way, then, you know, it's about distrust. It's about we don't trust you, so we are regulating you. But this is a huge thing in the trust area. This is very much um, one of the pivotal focus of earning trust and being trustworthy. But it opens up all sorts of really interesting new challenges for governance. Governance as if people can be trusted. Fascinating area. And the seven drivers of trust are key. So in all that melee of, you know, trust is this, trust is that, which really did my head in, then this consensus emerged. Actually, the drivers of trust, the things that make us trust individuals, organizations, each other, these are psychological factors. These are sociological factors. The evolutionary biologists um, and psychologists and the behavioral scientists and uh, coalesced on this idea that there are these seven drivers of trust. We can pick, you know, take some out and pull some in, but really these are core. So the intent, if your intent, and in our terms, the intent here is the public interest, is upheld through process, delivery, and outcomes. Public interest helps navigate this really complex terrain of trade-offs, different stakeholder voices, different perspectives, different values and ethical decisions. And only the public interest really gives you that guide rail and compass. And competence. So there's a great quote from the OECD, you know, you can be, if your heart's in the right place, that's great. But if you're incompetent, well, you know, that, it's not really going to work and you can't be trusted. And we're finding that in the UK with our COVID response as well. 
So again, the qualities of competence are effectiveness, reliability, consistency, responsiveness. There are qualities of competence that make us trust that competence more. And respect. So, you know, honestly, respect when I started this, respect means, you know, you're going to be respect your elders, Hillary. That's what parents used to say. And, you know, respect for me was all about that. But I really got to think and, and sort of understand more about how important respect is. In fact, you can almost take all of those away and, and think about respect. Seeing others as equals, listening to and taking seriously concerns. I mean, if I had to say one of the most important findings of the TIGTEC project, it is this concept of listening and taking seriously the concerns of people, particularly actually those people whose, whose opinion you don't really value, who you don't really think may have got a point. Time and time again, from even the late lessons from early warnings report from the Environment Agency, the European Environment Agency, to all sorts of governance disasters, somebody somewhere has been saying, no, no, really, you really need to listen to this, and they've been ignored. This is probably the most important finding. Openness, as we see again, openness, it's common sense. Of course, you need to be open, but somehow we just don't do that. Somehow we're not, you know, practicing openness and transparency in many ways um, in order to earn and build trust as actually would be possible. And I think Michelle really has taking that to, to really interesting levels with the Food Standards Agency. And fairness, very interesting how if the process is fair and the procedural justice principles of fairness, which are very much like these, these drivers of trust, people will trust the process. They will take on board even things that are penalizing them, even things that don't go their way or they don't even agree with. If the process is fair, um, then people will feel that the outcome is fair. And integrity, again, very important actually for governance. This idea, that, and I'm, it's a broad brush integrity here about being accountable, being impartial and independent of vested interests. And we don't just mean business there, we mean loud voices of all sorts of different types, political interests, NGO voices, bringing that, um, that, that integrity to the process. And the, and the last, but sort of not least in a way, is this idea of inclusion, of, of including and involving others. And I think part of that inclusion process, including citizens, involving citizens, really is important in terms of earning the whole trust in the governance process. And I've got to get going. So I want to just tell you, you know, we talked about common, you know, is this common sense? This is all common sense, these trust drivers, openness. We all know that, we just know that, but yet we really don't do it as much as we individually would like to do it. It feels scary. So I just wanted to think about, it's not, wasn't a full part of the, uh, of the research, but what gets in the way? And there are three really key things. What gets in the way of you know, embedding these trust drivers and, and really bringing them to life? So assumptions, honestly, when I looked into assumptions, it's not gonna happen. It can't happen, it won't happen that way. We just assume, and this is all of us, we all have our little own assumptions, beliefs, and little sort of bubble of thoughts. And it's, it's breaking through those assumptions, I think that really makes a big difference. And my, my old school teacher, when I was little, used to say, Hillary, do not assume, assume makes an ass of you and me. And I think she was right. And incentives, we won't go into that here, but there are so many incentives that are, you know, really acting against this concept of responsible governance, responsible innovation. But actually really importantly, distance. A lot of the time I was reading really interesting areas of governance designed detached, detached from the people they're governing, detached from the outcomes, detached from the citizens and detached from the whole process. And technology is detaching us all from each other. And those three things were really the keys to how governance can earn trust by thinking about those things, by stepping out, using the trust drivers as the drivers to earn trust in their governance. So I think, in theory, I'm gonna be finished there. So thank you very much for that. I'll stop sharing now and see if we have questions. Yes, hello. Thank you, Hilary, for that brilliant presentation. That was very, very interesting. 
So we have a couple of questions here from the chat, and I'm going to start off with Harold's question, which is, how would you connect trust, responsibility, and accountability? Oh, thanks for that, Harold. Um, trust, accountability, and responsibility. Accountability is one of the drivers of trust. I think when we're looking at the citizens' trust, it is a th it's more of a theoretical thing. The citizens aren't saying, are you accountable necessarily? No, I'm not agreeing with myself there. I'm not sure about that question. Am I allowed to say that? I don't know. I could come up with some stuff, but I don't know the answer with that. And I don't know if Harold has any answer. Does anyone else have any views on that, Tom? I know Tom will have views on that. Oh, I think, uh, I, I mean, just from my perspective, if I think if you look at it, you might, you might try to draw some connections there just by saying that if trust ultimately, you know, as Nietzsche, Nietzsche once said that, you know, there are no questions that are really about the past, right? All historical questions are questions about the future or questions about us in the present. So if you ask about ancient history, you're really just saying, how did I get where I am, right? And it's, it's really about, it's really about here. And so in a certain way, a lot of trust questions, many questions around trust are questions around security, which brings it back to yourself. And that responsibility and accountability like who who answers the basic question of like what happens when something goes wrong who do i turn to what do i so this 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 sense of having some sort of accountability and security being connected uh to the notion of trust and i think there's there's something there that we could maybe probably go a little bit deeper uh into if we wanted to get really deep into the, the philosophical origins or, or philosophical theory we could pull uh, we could we could ask angie to jump in and give us a little bit of a Give us a little bit of a refresher course um but uh, but we you know this is that would be you know that would be probably something that i would i would think of just in terms of connecting them is that there is a there's definitely a, a connection between security accountability and trust uh, michelle you're making any notes have you got any observations oh i'm trying mute no, no, my, I'm, I'm in the chat looking, there are various questions coming up where I think there, I do have observations. So I'm, I'm just making a note, maybe to touch on them in my bit. Go on. Go ahead, Sam. Yeah, so Hilary, I know you, you vaguely mentioned you weren't going to go too much into incentives, but Merv did ask a question which sparked quite a conversation in the chat uh, about that very subject. Um, so it started off with, how do we solve the problem of governments being both regulators and users um, and he, he talks about AI, but I think that's true of many of many technologies. Um, and, and from there, what incentives do do governments have uh, in order to be trustworthy? And does that you know extend to journalists and civil society? And who are some other actors in this space when it comes to earning trust? Yes, really interesting. Um, and I think this this shift that we're also seeing, because again, you know, as as, as Michelle knows. Governance and policy um, is is actually the foundation of a lot of regulation. So there is they, they can't detach themselves entirely from that. Um, but I, we're seeing more and more the expectation, uh, as the as the PA consulting report said, that 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 governance and regulatory regulators themselves should be more independent even of policy. And it, it's it's it's. A, a difficult concept it's it's in some ways it's more obvious in in some particular areas of governance than others um but i think i don't know again michelle perhaps that's one of one of those ones for you because that's one we discussed ourselves didn't we yeah and i think there is a there's a tension there we we, we call it the separation of risk and management and risk assessment so we have no, essentially had that separation. sorry I'm so, can you hear me yes you can david had unmuted himself so i, I muted him um, so, so, and I'll, I'll touch on this in a minute, but until, until very, well, until now, risk assessment for food has been entirely separate. That has been done in Europe. That is part of ETSA's role. They don't do risk management. They just do the assessment of the risk and give a view as to whether something's safe. Um, risk management has, or, or kind of policy, how it's implemented, how these things are done, has been done in member states. And we obviously have been discussing this an awful lot because in about four weeks time, risk assessment will be done by us too. And there have been some, some, you know, real reevaluations of, of how we can maintain our trustworthiness 
um, and, and a restructure of the organization and a very public process to go around it, which I'll, I can touch on. But, um, you know, there are trade offs against each of those things, because the other the other thing you sort of factor in is, is that, uh, you know, that distance between the the decisions that are made, the reality within which those decisions can be, can be implemented. And I think the big case there is GM, where um, and, and we hope we've got a way of, 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 of uh, uh, balancing those tensions, um, but it does require a real ongoing, expensive and honest commitment to, to, to near constant engagement with public mores, uh, which I think is where you, you try and mitigate that deficit of, of connection. So, um, so as someone's brought up to BSE, well, I, yeah, of course, I'm going to talk, talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Tom, any thoughts yourself? Um, just very generally, I mean, if I think this goes across the board, so any of these times when we look at, say, where is an authority, where is there an abuse of a potential for an abuse of power, even if it's by, um, if it's by slippery slope or accident or whatever the case may be, where you, you get put into that situation, uh, historically, what we've done from a governance standpoint, as well as with technology, right, is if you can't trust an authority, you have to trust the process, right? So you 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 shift it into a process so that you trust the process. And you also see that, and you see that very well with like distributed ledger technologies as well, right? It's, there is no central authority. These are distributed systems, but what we do is we trust the hashing, we trust the math, we trust the, the, the broad network, right? The fact that there are balances within it, et cetera. And so, um, you know, if you look at like what the forum, what the World Economic Forum has done in the last, you know, couple of years, working even with the UK on the procurement uh, principles around AI, for example. So there's a set of principles. Uh, there are certain processes that need to be followed, et cetera. So that it's it's, it's meant in, it's meant to take into account these types of uh, potential for, you know, uh, different things to to perhaps put too much power in one person's hands or to not have a set, uh, 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 an oversight mechanism in place. And I think also, just, I can see also talking in the chat about, you know, the role of civil society of, of, of journalists and, and this idea of openness and transparency, um, I think it really is so important. But, but what does actually it mean? You know, government needs to be more transparent. And I, I can see Seb here talking about special disclosure obligations or different, you know, more, radical openness and I think that, that, that there has to be more involvement of those people thinking up new ideas in that area I think certainly I can see in terms of in the AI there's a lot of innovation in there it's how it gets adopted by government and then how government can actually listen and, and embed those um, within the processes it's it's not a simple it's not a trivial or a simple idea to be radically open either I think we have time for just one last question. I'm going to follow up with Alison B. And I think you lightly touched on some of this in your answers, but it is a good question and it brings in the, the dimension of time into this. So she asks, did you learn anything about how slowly trust is earned versus how quickly it can be lost? You see, that's a great question. So, I, you know, it's a generally accepted wisdom that it's really difficult to earn and it's lost in an instant. I actually don't think it is lost in an instant. I think a trustworthy organization doesn't lose it in an instant. I think that actually you start to see things will go wrong, but they're ignored. And I think there will be early warnings of trust being lost um, if you're looking for them. It's not over the edge of a cliff. We have this thing called the trust spectrum that we're looking at, which is that, you know, trust is also associated with different behaviors. You can be passionately trusting and an advocate or passionately distrusting and a, and a campaigner against. And there's gradations in between. And I think you will see this loss of trust happening if you're listening and if you're out there and if you're attuned to the things that you're doing and the impact on your organization, institution, or person or on others. So I'm not sure this falling off a cliff from out the blue, big shock is necessarily true. Uh, Alison just asked a follow-up question and I, I think it's worth giving a little bit of time to. So can you give a few examples of some of those early warning signals of trust being lost? Oh yeah, interesting. 
Well, you know, there was going to be a great project on that. I mean, I think, you know, Michelle is a great one for that because a lot of them does come, some of these problems we've had in the, in the, in the UK on that that have been resolved. I think it's listening again to voices that you don't want to hear. So I see David G's there um, the, from the late lessons from early warnings report. And what that report does is sort of look at how these disasters evolved. And every single time there will be academics or NGOs or journalists pointing out the obvious. And because of these, the sort of mindset issues, incentive issues, um, her, you know, willful blindness type of mentality, which we all have, this is not, you know, no one's immune from this those signals get ignored. So I would say, if you haven't read Late Lessons from Early Warnings, although it's 2013, that all the lessons are in there. And there's a great one there on um, why business does not act with precaution to early warnings. Um, and it starts to look at the, the individual processes, the herd mentality, the leadership. Um, and you, you can sort of pick out a lot of those and see in advance um, where you might be missing something. And there's another good report in a, a book in governance um, by Ruth Steinholz and Christopher Hodges, who talks about this in terms of governance design and how a blame-free culture is probably the best way of avoiding, um, of, of spotting early warnings in advance. So supporting and rewarding those who speak up and speak out rather than penalizing them and sacking them. Okay, uh, I think that's the 10 minutes for this Q&A period, unless you want to do one more, Hilary? I'm good, let's get on with these, listening to these guys, they've got lots of good stuff. All right, so I'll hand it over to you to introduce Tom and Michelle. Right, Tom, hello. Oh, I've got to get my... Uh... So Tom is the Head of Innovation, Society and Policy at the World Economic Forum. Um, he's been a very good friend to TIGTEC over the period of time. He, he's written some really interesting work for the forum um, on governance and values. So what we're going to do is put in the chat a little bit later um, some of these reports that he's written. Um, multinational gov uh, international governance and the multi-stakeholder approach to governance and governance values and ethics um, and the fourth industrial revolution. So really interesting innovative um, white papers um, on governance. He's also, as I found from our discussions just these other day, incredibly knowledgeable about trust, which I actually didn't know as a, the psychology and philosophy of trust. So I'm excited to pass over to you there, Tom. Oh, thanks, Hilary. Um, and to be honest, I don't, I, I appreciate it's a very kind introduction, but, but looking at the questions in the chat, I almost don't even want to, to do my talk. I just want to talk about these questions uh, in the chat with the group here. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of rush through with just a couple of points, maybe, and then maybe we can entertain Sam if you want some more of uh, some more questions and kind of get the discussion going, because I really find um, I really find the more that we engage with each other, probably the, the more rewarding um, this will be. And, and I wanted to say thank you to Hillary because Hillary has been uh, a great friend uh, uh, to us at the forum in terms of being a Global Future Council member, uh, council co-chair. Um, as you know, Tig Tech, you know, had its, you know, origins in the Global Future Councils with Conrad, who uh, unfortunately uh, can't be here. Also, you know, the ethics booklet that I know that Angela uh, Hobbs, who's on the, who's on the, the call with all of us, uh, and Hillary worked on um, you know, for quite a bit, and then, and we'll be uh, delivering that next week with uh, more of stakeholders in uh, the Asia uh, Pacific region. So just great to 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 be here and be a part of the conversation. Um, and it just reminds me, you know, this that's, this idea of trustworthiness and 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 you know ethics and and how does this fit in governance? And it always reminded me of my grandfather who used to say, he he would say, you don't have a moral dilemma. You know what you're supposed to do. You just don't want to do it. <laughs> and, and of course, we know that that's not true. There are moral dilemmas. There are things that are problems. But it's one thing to remind you that very often, sometimes when it comes to something as simple as trustworthy, things don't need to be more complicated than they are. Sometimes we overcomplicate them. Um, and there are a few things, a few places where things can be helpful, especially uh, from what we see working with companies and governments around. And that is the ability to identify where and why conflicts arise around trust. Uh, very often, uh, you know, uh, we will see 
basically competing frameworks, right? You have different out, you know, so some, some group is looking at the consequences. The other group is looking at what does this mean for me in terms of my virtue as a person? Uh, what does this mean for me in terms of like, you know, the pragmatic outcome? Whereas uh, another group uh, that's involved in institution is looking at, well, what does this mean for a larger group of people's sets of interests combined? And so just starting in different places with different sets of outcomes, you know, can create issues of trust. Uh, and it's, if you can identify where those are, then you can start to have a conversation around them. Uh, I loved the, the bit uh, that we were just talking about right there, which was with, around time. Because one of the things that we've seen recently uh, in, especially ar around a lot of technology, which is primarily my area, uh, is working in you know, tech and governance, is that the temporal aspect of it can create trust issues. Because people might begin to think, well, wait a minute, shouldn't someone have been thinking about potential consequences you know, at the secondary and tertiary level? Uh, and one of those that's very often not looked at is the temporal aspect, which is, okay, so if you have principles about how to use my data, that's great. If you yourself are not sharing my data right, with people that shouldn't have it, that's great. But people don't often think, well, what if somebody buys you in 10 years and buys all your servers? <laughs> then what happens to my data, right? And who has it? And how do we know that it's going to be taken care of? And so... There's this, there's this real uh, sense that I have uh, in working with different groups that a lot of the trust questions for which Hillary has done such an excellent job in, in, in showing the drivers, these trust questions relate directly to those drivers. And I wrote down some of these questions because I related them to the technologies that I work with, whether it's AI or blockchain distributed ledger or IoT or biotech. And these questions are really simple, uh, but it's important to remember that these are the things that people think about um, and they come to and this is comes from this comes from working with groups and publics at universities, etc. And I've kind of paraphrased them here. And one is, for example, around AI, you know, does this technology recognize me as a person and not a thing? Right. I mean, that's that's something that, that if you haven't answered that question and you're using that technology, you might end up with a trust issue uh, with somebody. If, if, if you're thinking, you know, who or what will protect me right from errors? Um, in the distributed ledger, who's in charge? Who speaks for me if something goes wrong? Um, how do we stop bad actor if everything's anonymous? And you, these aren't theoretical questions to be answered. These are actual practical questions that need to be answered in order to fulfill the obligation of trustworthiness. Because if, if someone isn't thinking about these questions, how do you put your trust in someone who's not thinking about these questions that have your interests in mind? And so this, this sense of competing interest groups, aligning interests, at least taking an interest, your interest into account, whether it's through a particular set of principles or a process like we just talked about a while ago, or whether it's uh, about having a bigger, broader kind of um, uh, adoption of a principle around something like inclusion, where we say, you know, at the World Economic Forum, it's a multi-stakeholder organization. This has been a principle at, that is at our institution for quite a long time, which is civil society, government, business, and uh, you know the general public and academia all have to be brought together in order to help make decisions together. Uh, and that this is a better way of doing something. And, and Hillary and I had a nice conversation just the other day, and I think her response to that was, you know, more is always better when it comes to making certain types of decisions, having more input uh, from more stakeholder views. And so. Really where I'm coming from and where the form is coming from is this, this sense in the work that we've done, whether it's on tech and governance, whether it's on values and ethics, um, it's always been about how do we pull more stakeholders together uh, to have a conversation and take it forward. And I can leave a good bit. I've, I've, I have literally dusted through and left most of what I was gonna say off the table because I wanna get into many more of the questions that, uh, that people have, have brought to the chapter. Thanks very much, Tom. That's great. Um, I think what we'd like to do, shall we move straight to Michelle and take the and take the Q&A after that. So let me introduce you to Michelle Patel, who is head of social science at the Food Standards Agency, Britain's most trusted regulator, although the, the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority is, is sort of slightly miffed about that and they think they should be really. Um, but she uses social science and the involvement of citizens and stakeholders to enhance the evidence base upon which decisions on risk management and risk assessment are made about food and policy and regulation. 
So I'll hand over to you, Michelle. Thank you very much. Um, I, I agree, actually, they, they do a really good job of engaging and explaining uncertainty and risk. And, and, and that's something that uh, we obviously try to think about an awful lot. I'm just going to attempt to share some slides, if that's OK. Um, hopefully. You'll soon see some slides, yes? Yes, thank you, Tom. Um, so uh, this should be from the beginning. Can you, ah, there we are, right. Um, Hilary, I can't hear you, you're on mute, but um, that's all right. So thank you uh, to whoever shared early lessons, um, late lessons from early warnings. I think if you, if you want to know a bit more about why we were set up, there's an amazing case study there around BSE, which talks about how with a little bit less technocratic introspection, perhaps people might have seen some things coming and made some different decisions. And the Food Standards Agency may not have had to be brought into existence, but uh, we were brought in after the terrible case of BSE. And that is an example of where, in fact, there had been several early warnings um, and several decisions taken, which were not in line with the values of the people and communities that, 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 that were served by the regulator. And um, just to take it back to first principles, the reason why that's important is because, especially with something like food, the risks are vastly dispersed, but the decisions are taken in a very small um, place by a regulator that is not democratically elected. So we have this sort of deficit there and we have a danger that people are going to make decisions in their own self-interest or even in good faith, but not representing the interests of the people that are going to be directly affected by the risk. And this is what we saw happening with BSE. So when the Food Standards Agency was brought into being, being trustworthy was built into our DNA from the start. It predates me. All of the things I'm going to be talking about these are not my ideas. These are things that, uh, that, that have, have sort of been brought in from the, from the beginning of the Food Standards Act, which was in 2001, which is long, long before I joined. Because food's really important, obviously, we all eat, um, but it's also a systemic global risk filled business um, that presents habitual opportunities for things to go wrong, possibly three times a day for pretty much everybody. And we only really don't think about it because the risks are so routine. Um, and that is because uh, people, if people had to make a reflective decision around all of this and take everything into account, it would be far too much. You'd have an existential crisis and you'd never eat your dinner. But there is that means there's, a, again, a disconnect. Disconnect between what people are deliberately knowing they're doing when they're choosing what to eat and um, and the sort of, sort of heuristics that they have to use to, to, to make it through the day. And that gap can be filled with distrust really easily. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the dynamics that I see sometimes in research, because we, we know that the public worries about things and we know that it is, uh, food is a sort of a, a singular source of anxiety because of that, that, that forced, uh, there's no choice you have to eat there is choice within what you eat but there is so much information needed to make, be able to make a rational decision about it to align it with the values that you have you have to sort of delegate that to someone else and we're we're that someone else so that is that's delegated to a regulator um and to try and deserve that um and try and maintain trustworthiness uh we have to base that in the best scientific evidence available um and i think to answer one of your questions somebody said well how do, how do you do that when people pre scientists pretend they know everything well we, we can't pretend we know everything it's been quite well documented that if you communicate honest uncertainty your trustworthiness grows rather than if you pretend you knew and then of course it went wrong constant engagement i think is is, is something i touched on before it is it is high maintenance it's, it is expensive it is difficult it requires people like me who are learning every every day how to do it a little bit better there's a there's a huge raft of academic literature written about how to do it not very many examples of how people have done it very well um but one of the things that really brought this to the fore for us was over the past few years i think we've seen a lot written about the crisis of trust we've seen Edelman talking about the disconnect between you know social society and social trust and we had some fairly high profile food 
safety incidents, we would call them, we don't say scandals, um, but some high profile food safety incidents. And we couldn't understand at first when I had the chair and the, and the CEO standing around behind me. And at that point I was director of comms, not head of social science, um, doing jazz hands and wondering why our reputation wasn't in the bin. And I'm looking at the data and I'm going, it's going up. And I think that really caused us to think about what happens, not just when it goes wrong, but how do you get it right? Um, and I think what we get right, or what we got right, because we still, as you say, uh, are the most trusted regulator in the country. Um, what we get right is we, we really think hard about trustworthiness. And, and I was really glad to see you referencing an Aura O'Neill. I don't need to go in, into that, um, but that was the sort of philosophical basis of where we were coming from. And we went out to consumers and citizens. We looked at the whole of the academic literature um, we looked at the work that the OECD had been had been doing in terms of how you measure trust and and adapted that to our um, our ecosystem and um, we we started to develop real measures of trustworthiness not just for us but for the food industry um, and now we have an aggregate uh, score I guess against each of those that that, that we measure every six months and um, what it means. Is, is, is complicated, and it, but when you understand that, you, it, it answers the question, how quickly can it be lost? It answers the question, why did our stats go up when the situation went down? And it goes back to the two things that really, uh, the, 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 the composites of trust. So for me, there's two things. One is the intent, I guess you would say, Hillary, the values, are you demonstrating that your actions are in line with the best interests of the public that you serve and for us that's very simple because we are set up to, to serve the consumer we don't have any conflict it doesn't matter you know some, some other governance organizations would have to take a lot more ranges of sta stakeholders into account we're very single-minded actually we've been set up to be so and then on the other hand are you actually competent and consistent in your delivery against those values and what we discovered was people will forgive breaches in delivery, but they will not forgive breaches in values. And so if our response on these breaches of de delivery was to demonstrate very strongly, which it was, that we were correcting that in line with the values of the, of the publics that we serve, in fact, it cancelled it out and, and, and our trustworthiness seemed to go up. But when you get underneath that, it's quite a complex journey that you take people on when you're trying to explain things like this honest uncertainty because people don't really want to particularly when it comes to food they don't really want to open up that Pandora's box because food is really complicated and the decisions you make in the day-to-day -day may not be in fact in line with your own values people don't really want to understand where meat comes from where dairy comes from the journey kiwi fruit takes to your gate you know and and they often I often everyone makes decisions in the in the heat of the moment deceit decides to eat something and then you know on reflection the production and, and processes that got it to your plate may be something you don't really want to think about so when we're having dialogues with the public which we do on a near well actually I think every year since 2015 we've been doing these um, at scale um, a big a big investment we see this what we call the deliberative dip happen and, and, and it really happens every time you're talking about the food system where people don't want to think about it and surely everything's all right and then all of a sudden the world view is reframed by the complexity and they start to unpick every single little thing the stakes get very high emotions run high you see people get really upset and then as we come out of it as people go from what I would say a, ca a case of blind faith underpinned by anxiety into some sort of reasonable Set, set of knowledge that they can square away with their own decisions they come back around and, and I would rather have cautious trust than be a hostage to blind faith any day but this requires a huge investment of time and effort um, and, 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 a, and a iterative educational process and I'm not this is a lot I could talk about this forever but but actually what what I'm seeing recently is because information is becoming that much more democratized this is getting easier to do this is happening more quickly. It used to take weeks, now it's taking days. But when you're talking about why people don't do what Hillary rightly says is common sense, um, you've got to realise that the people in charge of these organisations have very different motivations 
underpinning this. So, so it's hard, you know, what, this is what it looks like when you're doing it right. That's not something any CEO really wants to see. And you have to have a lot of trust in the, the, the theoretical underpinnings to go out there and go, this has happened. We don't know yet. We're on it. And you're trading on that social trust that you've built up over years to go, well, okay, well, they're in charge. Well, I feel fine now. Or I feel better now. But but it but until that happens, you'll end up with with, with um, you know, in a con, con, uh, constant barrage of things that could make you want to hide in a room and shut the door. And that is the last thing you want to do. Because in real life, you've got to be out there demonstrating, as, as Baroness O'Neill says, demonstrating your trustworthiness, evidence of your trustworthiness. And that, that is something that we've taken on. Um, and it means a lot of things. It's not just a comms job, right? This is, this is, this is absolutely not about PR. This is about building a governance organization that has the brains and the guts to be trustworthy. So that means we get out there and we explain when we don't know, and we invest and in, in more systematic engagement with stakeholders. We publish everything we do. We, we, we in, proactively send out um, what we know, even if it is uncomfortable knowledge. Um, when something goes wrong, we have to show we're taking a hard line. We've got to remember that in order to do that, actually that, inf that influences everything, including our recruitment. We've got to it, recruit and develop the leaders in the organization who will be able to go on news night and do that. And that is hard. No one really wants to do that. And certainly if you've come up as a professional vet and then suddenly that's landed on you because you got promoted, you'd better be ready. Um, and we measure it, we, we monitor it constantly. And one of the things that I think has in, if anything increased since I start first started talking to Hillary about this stuff is our ability to real-time monitor so we're not just looking every six months now we're listening on social media every single day um, re reporting monthly directly into the CEO on what people are talking about when they're talking about food very very broad and the so the leadership have committed to several things the first one which has been since the start of the FSA is the open board meeting so anyone at all can show up in real life or on Teams um, to one of our board meetings and ask a question and get an answer. Or they can submit one by social media or they can email one to us and it will get read out, used to be my job, um, and uh, it will be answered by the senior official on the day or if that can't happen, there will be a, a, a written answer published afterwards. Um, we're taking this one step further. After January, we have committed to publishing all of our science and evidence on risk analysis around new food into the country before the ministers make a decision. We uh, don't get to make the decision, but we make the recommendations based on the evidence and anyone can see the evidence and, and judge the, the robustness of that. And included in that will be Re evidence, and this is where my job comes in, evidence from, from citizen engagement um, and socioeconomic uh, analysis as well, which we published at the same time as the um, human health risk assessment. And I, and, and I think you know anyone who's been looking at what has been happening in the discourse around COVID and whether one thing is being traded off against another, I think we'll appreciate why we want to do that. Um, they've committed to being highly visible and showing leadership in communications and stakeholder management and media activity, the no empty chairing. And in the exec, there's a, there's a, a point at which at every meeting, there's a, a reflection moment where, where, where the people who do make the decisions in the organization have to answer on, for their trustworthiness. They have to say, have we followed these values? It's a very light touch thing, something, you know, that, that uh, should be should be self-evident, but just causes people to reflect before they've just signed on the line and um, and putting this trustworthiness and authenticity at the core of our leadership development, because I think that is that, that is it, if more than ever going to be important to the, the, the effective governance of, of anything. Um, so. I'll finish there. I'm sure I've gone quite a little bit over my time, but I just wanted to reflect on a couple of things that came out in the in the chat. Um, and one of the other things that really affects trustworthiness is that not just who how you are, but who is 
deeming you to be trustworthy. Now, there's some very, very interesting analysis on what social inclusion does for people's trustingness. Essentially, if life has treated you better, you are more likely to trust. And so this is where you get into the question of who are you overlooking? Who is excluded? How can we reach them? Are we, and I think we need to take it away from a, well, the public just need to learn to trust us, to what are our blind spots? Who are we not reaching? Why is it not connecting with them? What are we getting wrong for them? Because actually, once you start to do that, you start to feel a tiny bit sheepish because you've there's some really obvious things that you just won't have seen because we are in a technocratic, often white, often Western, often middle class, often elite bubble. And I think the, the time for that with the changing world, and that's why I've put social media in, in, in my slide here, but, but that's just one facet of the changing relationship between authority and, and, um, and publics is, is that in order to earn public trust, we sort of need to come down off our high horses a bit and talk to people. I'll stop there. What a great place to stop. Yeah. Thank you very much, Michelle. If you can unshare yourself. I will attempt yeah. to unshare. Yeah. So isn't that great? So obviously with my trust drivers, I'm very close to those things, but every single one of those trust drivers is in there, brought to life and it's tough. It takes time, it takes effort, as Michelle said, but what a great case study. What was interesting, Michelle? Not one single piece of chat. Everybody was riveted, as they always are when you do presentations. So, um, Sam, can we, we've got, we really only, no, okay, we haven't actually got time, um, but we would like to carry on. So it's, it's three minutes to, we've got lots to talk about. Michelle has to leave at 3.15. We would like to carry on. Could we say, um, for those that have to go on the dot, I'd like to just say thank you so much to Michelle and to Tom and to Sam, and thank you to all of you for coming along. Um, but what we would like to do is just carry on. So if you would like to do, stick around, we will carry on, answer some of those chat, the chat, probably by about Monday, we might have finished having the discussion on it. So, you know, but maybe we'll have to stop a bit further earlier. So fantastically innovative and interesting things that we've, we've talked through today. Really great that we ended that with things happening in the real world, trust in action and trustworthiness in action. So thank you very much to everyone for joining us um, and please carry on and stand and carry on and put some more things in the chat if you'd like to, to uh, carry on the discussion. Over to you, Sam. Hey, um, that, was, that was absolutely fantastic, both Michelle, Michelle and Tom. Um, as Hillary says, and I think there were a few people waving their hands. So maybe what I suggest Hillary is, I'm, I might just um, ask a quick question of Michelle to touch on what she just spoke of, uh, summarize a bit of a question, questions around evidence and transparency that were happening in the chat. And then perhaps the last five minutes, we can actually just open up the discussion for uh, other people on the call who want to contribute um, viewpoints, if that sounds good for everybody. Um, so. Michelle, you said something that just really, really struck me and I kind of want to follow up on it. You talked about governance, governance institutions needing to have brains and guts in order to be trans trustworthy. Um, and you touched on this with social inclusion, but I want to open it to Tom and Hillary as well to respond. What do you think the role of heart is, is as well in this? So we know that humans are messy. Uh, and as you said, trust is often about social inclusion and things like that. So what is the role of heart in, in trustworthiness? Can I, can I just, I know I've talked a lot, but um, I think that humans, humans are messy is kind of where I start most of, most of my conversations with some of my colleagues who as very messy humans themselves don't realize quite how messy they are sometimes. We, we are human, and I think what, one of the things we can start by doing, and, and this is where the heart comes in, is really reevaluating that, that mo that power dynamic, that model that I think we some, quite a lot of regulators fall into, that they're cleverer um, and more educated and more qualified, and thus they, the, the masses out there can't possibly understand. And I think that the, the misunderstanding can go both ways. And um, if you if you start with a with, without value judgment in the basis of heuristics and those 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 rules of thumb that we all use because they're amazing experiments and expert bias just because you've got a PhD doesn't mean you're not subject to these things. Um, if you start with that, it's a great leveler, actually. 
Um, and it really helps to understand some of the, the otherwise irreconcilable gaps in, in risk communication for a start. I didn't want to say a thing of one of the things when we were looking at what, you know, what is a trust decision, what's it based on mentally, we came up with these four sort of areas, which is this idea of genetics, which might be body chemistry, heuristics and biases, um, experiences, so from when you're the youngest, to, you know, your experiences of being discriminated against or a little old lady that's not had any bad things happen, um, about context, so a trusted, you know, the, a pre-COVID context and a post-COVID context is entirely different world. But this idea of worldview, which is about your identity, your your sort of um, belief system, your values, what your, you know, who you identify in your, in, in, in within your life as, as trustworthy, and this is a really complicated thing. And I thought, well, Hillary, how helpful is this just to complicate things even more? But what it does lead to is actually an understanding that we are all really different. We have all got different experiences, different life experiences, different points of view. You can't actually clump us all together. And so therefore a bit more empathy and heart and a bit more sort of, sort of feeling and seeing people as people instead of publics, consumers, you know, whatever, I think is at the heart of all of this. Because if we see each other, all of, all of ourselves as us and none of this us and them thing, which is the starting point um, of perhaps all the problems we see in society today. Um, and I think that's where heart comes in because yes. we are different. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, person. Who's got the phone? Who's got the, come on. I, I muted them. Okay, good. <laughs> Shall we open? I can't see. Um, no, the, I saw someone with a hand up. Is that where you'd like to hang on then now, Sam? Uh, Tom, did you want to? Yeah. Oh, I was just I was just going to say I think that there's a, you know there there's a, a good deal of, of data on something like when you greet people going into a into a store right and and just to give it just a little bit of a um, anecdote uh, that we had we had previously discussed not in this not in this meeting but in other places but uh, you know a long time ago I worked for a big company I won't say uh, and I worked in loss prevention and when we brought people in when people came into the store we said, you know, someone said, and very often it, it was me, say, hi, how are you? Welcome, you know, to the store and uh, et cetera. And you gave somebody a smile, et cetera. And you watched the loss, the amount of theft and all of those sorts of things actually decreased quite a bit. And some people would be cynical and say, oh, well, it's just because people think you're watching them. And of course, but I always kind of suspected that actually, no, when you show someone that you see them and they see you and in philosophy, right, there's this old, there's this old theory of you're not really a self unless someone else sees you, right? Like, and there has to be an other. Uh, and so when, when you're seen, uh, not only do you become more of yourself, but then you recognize like, oh, I'm in a space. Now, this person has trusted me in a sense, right? They've given me, they've welcomed me. There's a certain sense of hospitality. There's all these types of issues of reciprocity that are deep within our behavior, et cetera, that makes it a, maybe a little bit more difficult, not for the hardcore person who came in there with, you know, with a particular purpose, but for the average person who might be susceptible to, you know, taking something or, or the kid or whatever. But if you've recognized them and you've seen them. And so I think a lot of the things is what we've talked about today is, is really the question is like, how do you put policies in place that show a person that they've been seen or accounted for? And that can't always be present in the outcome, right? Because sometimes you make decisions that favor some over others, but that can be always a part of the process of, of the governance. And so that to me, that to me, it feels like there's something, there's something, of course, there's something deeply human about governance and trust, right? In the way that, in the way that we work there, but it is, it, it maybe it's fundamental to the psychology of it and, and just to recognize back to the security point earlier right it's not security isn't just about safety like physical safety it's about psychological safety and not psychological safety from harm but psychological safety to say i can take a risk here or the psychological safety that says um this place is reliable i can rely on how i see the world here or that the world is going to be like this tomorrow or etc right there's different types of, of ways of, of, of building that psychology uh, that of, of uh, security um you know and then of course uh, there were great questions in the there were great questions in the chat you know on on trust and information and things like this and of course informational security uh economic security 
Uh, and those, there are trust issues in all of those, right? Is who's gonna change the rules on me? Are they gonna move the goalposts? <laughs> What's gonna happen? And, and so these are things that where if stakeholders, you know, in the broadest sense of the term are seen, we recognize what goals they're playing with, you know, in the sense of, is this about what kind of person I'm gonna be, or is it about the greatest good for the greatest number? Right? Is it about wealth and prosperity, or is it about, you know, the ability to for me to flourish, you know, uh, you know, or in the sense of follow my dreams and have a safety net in case something goes wrong? If we start to look at what those goals are, then maybe we can address issues of trust with a little bit, a a, a little bit greater acumen. You know? Yeah, and this is, I did want to give an opportunity. There was um, quite a threat in the chat around, as you said, transparency, evidence, uh, information, uh, and trust. Um, and I, I just wanted to give, Michelle touched some of this on her presentation, but she can reiterate and give you and Hillary an opportunity to chime in around uh, transparency in terms of how much is, is too much or what is open and, and useful. Um, and. Mm -hmm providing authoritative evidence and, and leaving room for misinformation and what this will look like. So I think I think there's a couple of things in there, there to unpack. I think that the uh, transparency is not the same as openness. Um, I think something can be transparent, but you don't get to influence it at all. I think openness is something more. Um, I think there's a, a lot of bad transparency done where data is dumped out there and it, in a way that can't be processed or used. Um, I think that, however, I understand why people do it because when I talk to citizens, the likelihood of people that are, haven't got a vested interest or an academic back, you know, a, a, goal or, or something using that data to actually provide to, to do anything meaningful is, is very little however they are deeply reassured by the fact that it's out there and i think that what it does is it allows uh an independent and account for those who can get you know and we tr we try really hard to make our data usable for people at, you know at a reasonable level of data skill because um you know, when it's out there and we provide the raw data as well as our analysis of it, our analysis is, is open to challenge. That is scary, um, but it is also means it's accountable. Um, and, and then that can be overseen and overheard and that accountability. So you don't have to be the one poking around in the data to be very happy that someone like Carol Cadwalada, I can't say the word Cadwalada, does do that. And as long as you have sufficient trust in that person, then okay. You know, so so it's a it's a there's a uh, there is a, uh, a a way of doing it. But I, I would say openness and transparency are kind of two different things. And I think I think openness is about kind of how do how do the interests of the public get understood, interpreted. I mean, what what you were just talking about is is a really big one for us because you you can't assume a consensus when people have got lots of different values driving their own decisions which to them feel as legitimate as as anything right so how do you make those trade-offs against economic benefit versus public health uh, i would say it's hard it's complicated and you do it with as many people involved as you can but that again it, it requires bravery and also you know time and money um and effort uh, and it's putting it out there, you know, it was, it was, it's not that long ago where these decisions used to be done in a room on their own for, for good utilitarian reasons. However, that we're not in that, we're not in that age anymore, I don't think. And it's interesting, we deliberately didn't put transparency, we deliberately put openness, because actually it is a whole different ball game. And you hear about transparency dumping, and you know, when we used to work, doing some work in nanotechnology and reach, it's like, yes, we have given you all the information, there, vomiting all sort of information, of, which no one can analyze and read. So that's where openness is a very different quality of thing. But I think back to something that was going on in the chat, um, one of the problems of accountability and openness is that there have to be, you know, people there to challenge and people like academics, journalists and civil society organisations and their, their budgets are being cut, their, the constraints of, of what they're able to be funded to do is, is changing sometimes as well with different sort of policy areas. 
So I think also it's really important to, to be open to challenge. People have to be funded and, in, and, and able to be challenged within the system. Uh, and, and that's, as far as I can hear as well from people like Civicus who talk about the, the um, hollowing out of civil society and a lot of work in academia I hear about directions of, of um, academic uh, sort of um, research being constrained in ways that actually don't allow challenge. I think that's an interesting you know, measure and early warning of potential problems for the future. And I think it's also worth it reflecting on the makeup of the people that traditionally constitute civil society as well yeah, yeah. Um, because there is something to be said about capture I mean you know I, I wonder whether there's more now we can do particularly with digital tools to have a much more inclusive view and not have to rely on representation quite so much yeah. because it is the disorganized interests that get overlooked absolutely and that's where the, 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 all of the work we're looking at in terms of engaging of citizens more widely I think is really important not just leaving it to five NGOs really who who are the ones who, who have got the time and effort to put the time in, you know. Speaking of, I'm afraid I probably have to leave in a minute. Oh, yes, you do. No, yes. one more question. I'm very happy to take it. And I, I'm sorry I can't stay around because this is this is such a fascinating discussion. Yeah, I was actually just gonna open open it up the forum for for anyone who maybe wants to make a, a quick comment or ask a more direct question. Um, and I, if your video is off, I can't quite see you. So maybe you just want to put your hand raised in the, in the, uh, on the participants there. Or just say it. I think I saw it. Or yeah, you know what, just, you can unmute yourself and maybe just, just pop out. Oh, Angela, are you raising your hand there? Yeah, Angela Hobbs. Hi, hi, Angie Hobbs, hi. Um, there may not be time for this and it's fine if you just say we don't have time for this, but I keep thinking you're, you're talking about good trust here and the links between good trust and trustworthiness. But as we all know, there's bad trust, there's dangerous trust. It's been referred to as blind faith. And so you're in good trust. Yes, the seven drivers of good trust, that, that will work. But as we all know, uh, certainly in politics, but not just in politics, it could apply to a, a lesser extent in business. We've all seen people around the world recently who have deliberately tried to make a divorce between trustworthiness and trust and have sought to gain and maintain power through divorcing trust from trustworthiness. And more than that, have actually said that looking for evidence of trustworthiness, for looking for evidence of accountability shows your lack of trust and your lack of faith and you are not a true believer and you're a sort of a failure in the, in the, in the cult, not that they would use the word cult. So that kind of blind trust, bad trust, which is being and has always been deliberately manipulated by certain people in governance is really, really dangerous. So as well as the seven good drivers to create good trust and be trustworthy and to create good trust, we also have to deal with the fact that social media in particular has accelerated the possibilities of bad trust being created and manipulated. And I don't know if any of the three of you have, it's something I wrestle with a lot in my, my, my daily job. I don't know if any of the three of you have ideas about how, how to deal with that issue of, of bad trust actually being in direct deliberately manipulated conflict with good trust i've got a, i've got one very short view um i think we've got to understand how that came to be exactly yeah. um and i think that it's a failure of those on the good side i, I try not to make value judgments but it's a failure to understand the needs and values of of people who have been left vulnerable to this sort of misinformation you're right possibly to talk about blind faith, you're right to talk about a cult, it's an emotional connection with people who feel that finally somebody understands me. <laughs> what a shame that it wasn't as understood. So I'm gonna go. Thanks very much, yeah. Yeah. fantastic, fantastic presentation. Yeah. Really, really yeah. appreciate it. Have you got any thoughts on my, that? Yeah, I mean, I guess, 
Angie, I mean, and, and other people can jump in as, as well on this thing. My, my initial thought is just, it, it isn't trust that's detached from trustworthiness? That's not really trust, right? That's just allegiance, right? So someone can demand allegiance, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they, but they can't demand trust. It's like demanding that someone love you. I mean, you know, someone can stay with you forever, but doesn't mean that they, you know, you see what I mean? Like there's something, there's something um, immat immaterial, not in the legal sense, right? But in the uh, present. I see, what, I see what you mean, but I'm not entirely yeah. persuaded. I think the emotion of really trusting, of really believe, of believing, I think it goes, I think it is the same quality of emotion as the kind of, I mean, you, you know, you can talk, you can make it an argument of semantics and say this isn't about trust because it doesn't meet our criteria for good trust. OK, but I think emotionally it is so close. Um, it is. And as Michelle was saying, we have to look at the causes of that and we have to look at the failures of understanding in the people who are genuinely trustworthy. Um, so, and it's, it's something I've been banging on about for years about, about the failure to listen and to hear. And, um, but I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but I think, I think it's too easy to say, oh, that's not really trust. It's just a kind of allegiance. I think emotionally, I think the, the architecture is it, is, it is, it is trust. It is really, really absolutely believing that this person or this group have your best interest at heart and that you would follow them no matter what and whatever else anybody else is going to tell you, you're not going to believe it because you utterly trust this source and so i would want yeah. i would want to call it trust and i as you say we have to and as michelle said we have to look at this the worldview the values the fears the hopes and the failure of genuinely trustworthy people to understand that yeah i, yeah. I mean that's an amazing it's an amazing uh it's an amazing thing to have to think about just because it it kind of highlights the rupture between something like evidence, right? Uh, which is if you're a technocratic, if you're inclined to be more of a technocratic kind of person, the idea that, well, here's the evidence, therefore you should trust, right? And, and it, it highlights that rift when, when you describe it that way, Angie, uh, because, and it maybe shows us a little bit more about the importance of trust being built from spaces outside of here's evidence or here are the reasons, et cetera, very much in the way that advertising uh, in many companies a long time ago, you know, it used to be the product oriented advertising. Here is the vacuum. It has to this many horsepower. The battery will last this long or whatever. Right. And this is why you should buy it. And then now it's much more of a here's what you can do with it and why you want it. And it's about you now. Right. And so it's now customer oriented. So the, the complete change in how to build that relationship between a, a, an organization or, or that's selling a product. And their and their customer and and so there's something that about the trust and that that relationship that that really isn't about uh the information yeah exactly it's about the behavior and it's about the relationship it is it uh, that's absolutely true and as, as hillary was saying it we've got to look at the heart as well as the head and mm -hmm. i imagine most of us in this space here we are trained to look for reasons and evidence and to believe them and have trust in them and but also, I'm sure everybody, and certainly I can think of areas of my life where I have behaved just ludicrously because I just have not wanted to believe the evidence. You know, we can all do this in love and, and elsewhere. So none of us is immune to this. And I think it's, but it's really important not to assume that trust is automatically going to follow reasons, evidence, trustworthiness I mean, yeah I think Angie would like to that's what our trust dynamic is all about because we're all talking about Trump a lot of the time aren't we when we're having this conversation deliberately undermining trust but yeah and each time he says the more outrageous thing you think all these followers surely are just going to follow fall away and he actually gets you know they, they trust him so much that whatever he says they interpret that as no, this is my guy. This is back to our worldview and identity thing. We, our identity is aligned with him 
and, and him with us. And therefore we bestow our trust on him almost regardless of his actions and, and what he actually says and does. But I think it comes back to what Michelle says, that the reason that people trust someone who is so untrustworthy can be picked apart in some ways by looking at experiences, at life chances, at, at, at all of these underpinning issues and context behind how, how people work, how, how people react. That's right. And, and also, I'm, I'm being careful never to feel superior. Oh, yeah. Just because, you know, I mean, I know I'm incredibly lucky to have had the education I have, have had. And I know that even with all that education, I've made some, done some daft things in my life. And I have trusted the wrong people for far longer than they should have been trusted because I so, so wanted to believe in them and I'd invested so much. And we can all do that. And I think we have to show, show a little bit of humility and a bit of empathy mm. and trying to understand that doesn't mean to tolerate, it doesn't mean to ignore, it doesn't mean to approve or respect, but to always to try to understand what is going on. I mean, yes, Trump's been very, well, he's, well, if what he's done or his team have done is this utter trust in him and then using that to not trust even a Republican, you know, uh, electoral sort of, I don't know the correct terms, Tom will know the correct terms, you know, sort of saying, you know, I'm a Republican, I can tell you that the Georgian vote is accurate, but and will still not believe, but um, that's again the identity. That's on a huge scale, but, but we have to try to always understand that and never feel superior and remember bits in our own life when we have, not maybe in an election like that, but have made similar mistakes and look at the drivers of why, and look back on why we trusted the wrong organisations or the wrong people. I think it's back to our respect driver. We've got to respect people even if you don't understand them, even if you don't agree with them. Anyway, sorry Sam. No, I was just going to say, I think respect and humility is the perfect place to maybe wrap a little bit of this up. We have about five minutes and then we can end on the half hour, which is a solid amount over what we'd originally budgeted. Um, Hillary, Tom, I just want to give you maybe each a few moments to just kind of summarize or say anything, anything else that's on your minds that maybe just didn't quite get a moment to be touched on, or if you want to circle back to any particular themes, just have a few, a few closing words. Tom, go ahead. Oh, sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think that, I think that, so I I've think, you know, um, you know, caring about other people, taking into consideration their viewpoint, no matter where it comes from or how we feel about, you know, uh, you know, something that they're looking at is, is, is part of just, you know, you know, our basic human kind of what we owe to each other. You know, how do we, how should we treat one another, you know, as we'd like to be treated, as it were, if we have to go back to the golden rule. But um, I think really, I just want to say, you know, there, there are a lot of people working on these topics. Uh, I mean, Hillary's been working with the, the, you know, on the ethics, the ethics booklet and a different, uh, different project that she's on. She's been working with this, with Tic Tech and Trust. Uh, you know, I know that Angie has been helping. Angie is also part of our Global Future Council. Um, you know, there are a lot of people out there with their initiatives across the world. Uh, next week, we'll be talking with Pam, uh, you know, in Hong Kong around, you know, ethics and things like this. So people are really interested in this topic and not just interested in a kind of a curious way, but in a way that that is essential to our lives, right? This means something. This is about human meaning in life, uh, right? What, how do we live with one another and how do we govern ourselves? And this is always, you know, and this is a community. And so it's a set of our, it's a set of our, you know, obligations that we have to one another. And I think that's why it's such a, it's such a topic that while it can be seen as esoteric, it can be seen as expensive, you know, if you're a company, it can be seen uh, in, a, in a lot of different lights. It's something that's fundamentally critical and essential to, you know, our, our ability to remain gregarious animals <laughs> that come together and, and talk to one another and spend time with one another and learn from one another. And so um, 
I will continue to be here uh, and am willing to have conversations or you know follow up with anyone who would like to afterwards. And then also just to say, you know, from the forum side, there's a lot of work that's been done over the last few years, whether it's you know white paper on values and ethics or responsible uh, governance of technologies or global governance of technologies uh, or just agile governance in and of itself, you know, from, from that sense of like agile governance doesn't mean untrustworthy, it means trust, you know, it's, it should be trustworthy as well. So this sense of being responsible and responsive, all of that work that's being done at the forum, you know, feel free to check it out and look and see if there are any resources there that can be useful to you. And if you need anything from me, feel free to reach directly out to me. Uh, I'm good. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Really do appreciate it. Um, and I think I've just seen that Andrew Maynard is here from the US, and it's the, virtually the middle of the night. So, Andrew, I, you know, I, please have, uh, if you have anything to, to talk about, to offer about, I think you deserve a little slot for being here in the middle of the night. No, it's actually 8.30 in the morning, and I was eating oh, breakfast okay. while listening to you. <laughs> That's okay. So this has been fantastic. The, the one thing I would say is I think there are challenges with how you begin to approach and even talk about trust um, and trust in governance from um, different parts of the world. So um, looking at this as a Brit in the US, things look very different indeed. I and mean, even how you begin to talk about Trump um, and how you begin to start with a priori assumptions that, that Trump is bad and Trump is manipulative. Because if you talk to the people that are supporting him, they would say, no, it's you that's wrong. It's you that aren't, is not listening to me. Yeah, absolutely right. That is exactly it. And, and but this is great. So Conrad mentioning culture is massive. And in fact, for some reason, I've managed to miss that out of my, my sort of trust dynamic. Each individual country you see from Germany to France to the UK, it's entirely different. So you, you can't really talk about trust and these issues in a generic sense at all, really. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it was interesting. I'm just thinking about the things that, that we're dealing with very specifically here and, and I'm dealing with in my, my role here. Um, diversity and equity, massive thing in the US at the moment. And certainly at Arizona State University, it is impacting everything we do. Um, same with coronavirus. Um, and when you look at approaches to trust and governance, even at a micro scale, so take Arizona State University, large institution where there are still governance um, structures, governance approaches, governance decisions, everything is totally and utterly different to everything that has been discussed here in terms of the, the challenges, the landscape, the philosophies, the mindsets, the actions. Um, so understanding how the, the basis of, of what you're developing, which is incredibly important, fits in with situations like this is also critical. What do you suggest? Um, I don't know, but I, but I think that the, the, the basis, the foundations of what you're doing is incredibly important here. I think one of the interesting things is asking how those basics, those foundations can be translated to specific circumstances and situations. So for instance, if you're looking at the US, and I wouldn't take the US as a whole, but I would take particularly ca particular cases and communities. Um, I think it's a really good question to ask, well, how do we build something which is context specific from these in those circumstances? Well, I, I, I didn't say this and I, I should have said this as well, but the point of these trust drivers is that, you know, they have to be really right down and used on the ground. There's, I mean, there's no point living in the stratosphere here. It's just, it's just pointless, useless. It doesn't really take us anywhere. But yep. that's why I like Michelle. So Michelle, how down to earth is that? And how down to the real world is that? And I think I really like what she's doing um, there. And I, we're finding that in AI, I'm sure you know, Andrew, it's all still in the stratosphere, really, really. It is. I, it, it is. And I, I think you probably know one of my challenges with the, the dialogue around AI is that it's actually divorced from reality in many cases. And I think sometimes intentionally divorced. Yeah. I mean, that's in my presentation in one way, I'm, I'm sort of mentally ticking off the things were there, you know, divorced from reality, da 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 da. But again, they're theories, and it, it, we just have to do instead of just talk, and that's a difficulty. Yeah. Anyway, I do have to go now. Really. Okay. Really this nice has been fantastic. Thank good you. Good luck with your yeah, new maybe, book. Andrew yeah. has a new book out called Future Rising, and good luck with that and the publicity <laughs> on that as well. We need to have a chat about that sometime. I'd like to talk yes. to you. Yes. Great. Yeah. Okay, thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks. Maybe next time we'll talk a little bit more about the the trust and information aspect, but. Uh,
Oh, that's a different that's, that's a different that's a different topic altogether that's uh but that's anyway good. thank you very much to the people yeah. that it really lovely to talk to you i don't know if ralph and tanya you want to hang on for a bit afterwards and have a chat but thank you very much for being here and thank you very much for listening and participating really uh, greatly appreciated thanks to tom and thanks very much to sam what a great job you did there sam thank you goodbye everybody have a good